Welcome to A Look Ahead. As you may know, if you've seen us before, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is for the fourth quarter of 2012. It's a series talking about our fundamental beliefs, the fundamental beliefs that are taught in Scripture. This particular lesson is particularly important. It's lesson number four for October 27, discussing salvation as the only solution. In light of that, we would like to ask you to get out your Bibles and bow your heads with us because here we go. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the insights you've given us, for the challenges of understanding all that is in Scripture, to exercise our mental powers and to think as clearly as possible about the wonderful provisions you have made in the plan of salvation. May we grasp them clearly and perceptively today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson will focus on the enormous problem of sin and what God has done to deal with it. It actually says in Romans 8, 3, God sent his son to deal with sin or concerning sin or to, to deal, to take away sin. But when talking about the sin problem, we must recognize that sin began in heaven, right next to the throne of God in the heavenly sanctuary. You know, of course, the passage in Romans 12, 1 to 12, where it discusses that. It did not start here on this earth in the Garden of Eden. So we must always keep our, in mind the fact that sin began outside of our environment. Sin has been described in many ways. The, scripture defines, the scriptural de definitions of sin are found in three places. 1 John 3, 4 is the one that most people are familiar with. And this is translated in various ways. My Good News Bible says, whoever sins is guilty of breaking God's law because sin is a breaking of the law. In actual fact, the Greek simply says, hamartin esten anomia. Sin is lawlessness or sin is rebelliousness. So, Does the King James there say sin is transgression of the law? The King James says sin is a transgression of the law. James 4.17 takes a slightly different approach. So then those who do not do the good they know they should do are guilty of sin. Now this would be what we sometimes refer to as sins of what? Omission. Omission. So others are sins of commission, things we do that we shouldn't do. Here it's talking about sins of <coughs> things that we don't do that we should do. And then there's the one definition I like best of all. It's found in Romans 14.23 at the end of a chapter discussing eating food offered to idols. Let me read the whole, chat, uh, the whole verse, although it's the last phrase that we're particularly interested in. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith, and anything that is not based on faith is sin. What do you think it means when it says anything that's not based on faith is sin? What do you suppose that implies? Well, it means uh, to me <coughs> if you do something not uh, thinking that it's wrong, it probably is wrong for you. If you do something thinking it's wrong, you're literally damaging your nervous system when you do it. Yeah. Um, the only thing that brings us back to God, of course, is faith, as it suggested. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment. So we have a two-way street. We can move away from God, and that's called sin, or we can move toward God, and that's called faith, Could righteousness. you explain, you said, if you do something that you think is wrong, it damages your nervous system. Yeah. How does it damage your... Does it damage your physical nervous system? Well, our, our nervous system is a physical thing. The mind is a function of the brain. 
So something, uh, obviously I can't explain all the details, but something is happening in there. We all know this for a fact because we know that if we do something wrong, it's easier to do it the next time, it's easier to do it the next time, and we've done it lots of times, it becomes almost impossible not to do it. And so then it becomes easier to do a little bit more wrong. Yeah. Because the path gets wider and deeper. Yep. It can mm. go to the point where it's no longer, you, you don't care. Yeah. It's normal for you. So yeah. on the other hand, if you do right, when you think you should always do right, you're building a path in your mind to do right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's correct. Well, in the New Testament, the Greek word pistis is the one that's translated faith, belief, trust, confidence, all those things are, are rolled up into that one word. And it is described in Acts 16, 31 as the only basis for salvation. So what is faith? Well, there aren't any just clear definitions in Scripture just as faith is such. Now you might think of Hebrews 11.1, 1, uh, and I don't have time to go there now, but Hebrews 11.1 1 actually talks about what faith does and not so much about what faith is. I'm going to read just briefly a definition of faith that was put together by one of my mentors, one of my favorite friends. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. Now we can't say will be because who knew God best of all? Lucifer. Lucifer, and what was the result? Not, well I shouldn't say what was the result, he still chose to rebel, didn't he? So we can't say will be, but maybe. Faith implies an attitude toward a God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed. So that's what the faith is based on. It's based on evidence. To be willing to believe what he says as soon as we're sure he's the one saying it. To accept what he offers as soon as we're sure he is the one offering it. And to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure that he is one, he's the one wishing it. Without reservation, for the rest of eternity, anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. And that is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means, and many people have a serious question about this part, faith also means that like Abraham and Moses, whom the Bible calls God's friends, there aren't many people in the Bible described as God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. So faith is just the opposite of people who say, well, I just trust God, I don't need to ask any questions, I don't need to know, just tell me what to do. No, faith means reverently, respectfully, we ask questions because we want more evidence, we want to understand him clearly. Now that's a very fundamental thing, and by the way, if you're interested in this handout that we're working on here, uh, it's available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can have this handout to use, if you like, when you discuss your Sabbath school class, in, in your Sabbath school class. Dr. Edward Heppenstall was a great theologian, university professor and theological seminary teacher. He pointed out on various occasions that sin can never be stamped out no matter how hard we try, sin can only be crowded out by filling our lives with God and godly activities which focus on our lives, focus, um, which focus our lives and how we can live more like Jesus Christ. Albert Hubbard said, men are not punished for their sins, but by them. And Matthew Ronald responded, if you're headed in the wrong direction, God allows U-turns. So, we have a lot of long, complicated Latin words that are used to try to describe the process of salvation. Salvation itself is one of those words. We have the word justification and we have the word sanctification. What do we do with those long words? Well, let's see if we can look back at the, the, the basis for those words and 
work, work our way through it. Salvation has a basic meaning of healing. So if it's not healing, if, if, if something is not contributing to the healing of the sin problem, it shouldn't be a part of salvation. God can heal all the damage done if we just allow him to. But God's solution is much larger than dealing with sin on this earth. The questions and accusations raised by Lucifer, Satan, against God must be answered, and all doubts about God must be resolved even among the loyal members of the universe. Now, what are we talking about there? The, there were two-thirds of the angels who did Being not loyal. go with uh, Lucifer or Satan but they might have a question in their mind as to who God really is, and, and did Satan have a, a point? Well, I mean, a third of the other angels, the other third of angels rebelled and, and joined Satan's side. And they now knew we, God. And they knew God. They were living in heaven in the very presence of God, and they still were convinced by Satan's argument somehow to rebel against him. I mean, and imagine if all of a sudden you find out that your friend's on the other side. What do you say? You know, some of the most damaging wars are wars of words and wars of thought. And you can be told that people are terrible, terrible, terrible. And you think that person is terrible. And I try to make it a point, since that's happened to me, and the person wasn't terrible. And... Um, to find out who the person is on your own and not listen to other people. Because mm -hmm. they can absolutely murder people yeah. in other people's minds. Well, it turns out that in the plan of salvation, if we study carefully, we discover that the same evidence which has convinced the loyal members of the onlooking universe to remain faithful to God is exactly the evidence that we need to establish our faith in God. Now, justification, sanctification, even salvation are long Latin terms which many do not fully understand. I'm not sure I do. However, we, it may not be necessary to understand all the nuances of those terms. Every one of them happens by faith. Our part is not the justification, sanctification, or salvation, but the faith. God takes care of His side. If we can come to trust God, he can and will do whatever is necessary to heal and save us. But what's the problem? We live in a world that's awash in sin. Just, I mean, we're, we're drowning in it. It is all around us. It seems to be getting worse all the time. But God has promised that he can deal with the sin problem even on this sinful planet. And the whole universe is watching to see what God will do. And where's the evidence for that? Well, there's lots of verses, but perhaps the clearest one is 1 Corinthians 4, 9. I'll read it again from my Good News Bible. For it seems to me, this is Paul talking, it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle. And that's the Greek word theater or theatron for the whole world of angels and of humanity. So who does he mention first? Angels. The plan of salvation was first of, of all, in Paul's mind, for the benefit of the angels. In fact, the whole, this earth was created for the benefit of the two-thirds of the angels that hung around in heaven, mm -hmm. that stayed there, because they had questions, and those questions have to be answered and the questions were so involved that it takes a long, long yeah. time. What, what you're saying basically is when the sin problem arose on this earth, God says, okay, this is our time. We're not going to do this again. We're going to do it one time. We're going to demonstrate the truth. We're going to solve the problem. And here's, here's the experimental group, and we're a part of it. I would back up and I would say the problem of the sin having arisen in heaven, mm -hmm. God created this earth. Of course, he knew it all be... He knew before he created any intelligent creatures, he knew that Lucifer was going to do what he did and he's yeah. going to lose the third. But he had this teaching aid, planet Earth, to educate 
and to confirm uh, what God had been saying all along. But it takes a, a long time to get that thing yeah. gelled in your mind. Well, he, 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 go ahead. It goes deeper than that. The teaching aid is planet Earth. Uh, he uses planet Earth, but really we can say that God uses every one of us, a human being, to exactly. prove his, to prove God's character. Mm -hmm. Now that is pretty scary. Mm -hmm. When God will use, and, and I will say idiot, uh, whatever sinful me, to prove his character to others. I mean, that's scary. Can you imagine entrusting your character? You had to show your character through another person. Yeah. And so God is so powerful, and he can clean up a person so God's character shines in that person. Mm -hmm. But So we're the teaching tools. Yeah. But evil beings, evil people are still part of the teaching t education that has to be done. Evil has to be demonstrated what it will do when it's left to run its own course. Mm -hmm. Unchecked. And we've never, there's never, God has never had a time in the history of the universe where he can let evil run its course naturally. Remember, it's been said that if, if Satan, when he separated himself from God, he would have died. Mm -hmm. So who's keeping evil going? God. God's keeping evil going. Oh, that sounds terrible. But well, sep sin separates from God, you die. And the rest of the onlooking universe would have misunderstood had they seen Lucifer. Well, well, he must have done something wrong. God must have killed him. I mean, how, what are their thinking did they have to do? And it wasn't until the cross that they could finally understand yep. that what God had been saying. So they, 2,000 years ago, the heavenly beings pretty much got it put together. Mm -hmm. But he's gracious to, to work with the rest of us. At the cross, the rest of the angels and the angels saw that Satan would go so far as to actually murder God, where Satan had been in disguise until then, and he, he did not show himself as a murderer. He just said God was unfair, mm -hmm. he's not, yep. I can do things better. But he showed he was an actual murderer at the cross. If you look back, he started this earth with almost a thousand year lifespans. Mm -hmm. And you see what evil runs its course over a thousand years. Well, then about the time of the flood, he shortens the lifespan down to about 120 years. Now you see a whole bunch more evil lifespans. The onlooking universe has learned the lesson pretty well. Got it put together 2,000 years ago. We can but he's very gracious. Pretty, we can do evil pretty fast today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you have to see those lifespans to see how it naturally works itself out and that God is not involved in, in hurrying it along. He just has but he, he can't let the thing run its own course because the thing would all collapse. It would, it, sin would destroy itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, going back to that first part, I, there's a couple things we'd like to, I'd like to look at. Even though God is in no way responsible for sin, he knew it was coming since he has foreknowledge. His plan to deal with sin was already in place when sin occurred in heaven. What is the evidence for that? Well, we have a number of verses. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, Titus 1, 1 and 2, Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 to 14, and Revelation 13, 8. I'm going to read just Revelation 14, 6 and 7, and every Adventist ought to be very familiar with these verses. Then I saw another angel fly high in the heaven with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth. When it says eternal, what's the implication? The message has been there from the beginning of the beginning. Yep. Everlasting. Yep. So it wasn't the message didn't start with Christ's birth. Mm -hmm. It started with the beginning of God. Yeah. Ellen White put it in these words, as soon as there was sin, there was a savior. Christ knew that he would have to suffer, yet he became man's substitute. As soon as Adam sinned, the Son of God presented himself as a surety for the human race, with just as much power to avert the doom pronounced upon the guilty as when he died upon the cross of Calvary. That's from the LNG White Comments, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1084, paragraph 8. But even before Adam sinned, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit had this plan in mind, mm -hmm. the contingency plan. Well, and let's explain why. When sin occurred here on this earth, 
God needed to take immediate action because apart from him, we're dead. Look at a couple of verses, Isaiah 59, 2. It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. And who is the only source of life? The infinite one. God. And Paul describes that, Acts 17, 28, as someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. And as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. So what happens if we remove the source of life? Ellen White described that in a very poetic way that I love in Review and Herald, December 2, 1890, paragraph 15, when she said, every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Now that doesn't mean God is standing there going on your heart. What it means is, all those chemical reactions, those biochemical things, all those physiologic things that keep your heart beating are there and they work because, the power, because of the strength and the power that God has, you know, genetically and in and, and salvation ways implanted into us as human beings. Okay? So in every way, physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually, we are dependent upon God moment by moment. So now, getting back to, we've talked about the sin problem a little bit. Let's talk about what God's plan was. What is, what is God's goal? I mean, what would he like to accomplish? To save everybody. John 12, 32. Yeah. He would if like, I be lifted up, I will draw all unto myself. Yeah. And, uh, but, he would like to save everybody, wouldn't yeah. he? They would really like, he would even like to save Lucifer and Satan, or Satan, if it were possible. However, he knows that will not be possible. It God would be a violation of their, of their choice. Yeah. They, they chose one direction and God won't. God respects their freedom so much that he won't interfere with that. But he has put in place a plan to save everyone who's willing to cooperate. It is his ultimate goal for all his children to live together in peace, love and harmony for the rest of eternity. God is not going to be setting up the new heavens and the new earth until he can have a core group, at least a core group of people that will be ready to, to, to live there in safety, in cooperation, in love for the rest of eternity. I He's not going to have the great controversy start all over again. I think you said once, God's not going to have any padded jail cells in heaven. No. <laughs> and so if we have, and Ellen White says, the thing we take to heaven is our character, mm -hmm. the kind of person we are. And so if we like to steal, hurt people, do whatever, um, we will not be happy in heaven because mm -hmm. that will not be a place to do that. So we have to yeah. not live there. Let me, let me just say that the way I said it, and okay. you, you're doing okay. I said, Theoretically, God could save everybody. All he would have to do is turn the entire heavens, and maybe the rest of the universe, into solitary confinement cells, put each one of us in a different cell so we can't possibly hurt each other, and, and he could save everybody. On, on those kind of circumstances. If but God would save as heal. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an impossibility. What? Yeah, what would, what would be the point, <laughs> right? the definition yeah. here. So he, God wants to heal us yeah. so that we don't need a padded cell in That's heaven right. and we can um, live harmoniously with our neighbors. Yeah. Well, there are many passages in Scripture that suggest that sin is deadly. And there is nothing that we as human beings on our own can do about it. Uh, a couple of very familiar ones are Jeremiah 17, 29. Who can understand the human heart? There is nothing else so deceitful, it is too sick to be healed. That's exciting, isn't it? 17, 9, I think it was. What did I say? 29. Sorry, 17, 9. Romans 5, 12. Sin came into the world through one man, and sin has brought death with it. As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. We all are in part of the party here. Well, the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament was supposed to teach people that sin is exceedingly 
deadly. I mean, why did all those animals need to die? To prove that, I mean, the whole idea is that sin is deadly. Unfortunately, being surrounded by sin every day, we become familiar with sin and begin to feel like it is almost normal. Alexander Pope wrote those famous words a long time ago, Vice is a monster of such frightful mien that to be hated needs but to be seen. But seen too oft, familiar with their face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. And that's the serious problem of sin. So how do we deal with this deadly disease? Left to ourselves, or perhaps to the devices of Satan, we would all be destroyed. If, Satan, if God would just leave this earth, apart from the fact that, of course, we would, we would immediately die if God left us completely, but even if God said, okay, I'll take my people away, I'll just leave Satan here with all, I'll leave all the selfish people here on planet earth, what would happen? It wouldn't be very long before everybody here would have destroyed, I mean, someone would throw a bomb or whatever, and pretty soon everything would be destroyed. So, another parallel to that would be if there were only predators, soon there would cease to be any predators because mm -hmm. they'd all to destroy. Yeah. In <coughs> fact, Satan claimed that every human being who is born on this earth will sooner or later become a sinner. One of the verses to support that is actually Job, chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus proved him wrong. Satan claimed that everyone who had died, who has died, even in the first death, and certainly in the second death, belongs to him. Jesus, once again, proved him wrong. What does the life and death of Jesus, or why does the life and death of Jesus solve the sin problem? How does the cross affect my salvation? Now we're talking really, really fundamental, basic Christian questions. Well, Jesus did not sin Right. And yet he went to the cross. Mm -hmm. Okay, why? Well, there's a couple sides to that question. The first question, it's amazing to us, and it should be amazing to us. It should be very, very convincing to us that he was willing to do that. That's one side. The fact that God was willing to do what he did to save us. That should appeal to us. It should bring us to our knees at the foot of the cross. But the other side of that question is, why was that necessary? What needed to happen? And you're all going to answer that question <laughs> for me, we right? Either, we either all died or <coughs> somebody paid the price, and that's what he did. Okay. Well, why does the life and death of Jesus solve the sin problem? How does the cross affect my salvation? Was he paying, look, and let me just mention some of the suggestions that have been made in the past. Was he paying a debt incurred by our sin and required by our righteous or offended or even angry God? Or was there some larger reason why he came to live and die on this earth? Look at a couple of passages. Look at Luke 18, 9 to 14. Jesus also told this parable to people who were sure of their own goodness and despised everybody else. And who would those be? Pharisees. The Pharisees. Once us. there were two and us. us yes. Once there were two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood apart by himself and prayed, I thank you, God, that I am not greedy, dishonest, or an adulterer like everybody else. I thank you that I am not like that tax collector over there. I fast two days a week, and I give you a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even raise his voice to heaven, but beat on his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, said Jesus, the tax collector and not the Pharisee was in the right, and right there, that's the word if you read the more traditional translations, was justified before God when he went home. For all who make themselves great will be humble, humbled, and all who humble themselves will be made great. So what should we learn from that? 
we learn to recognize that we are sinner and mm -hmm. we are sinners and the unmerited love that God has bestowed upon us through his son mm -hmm. that we should cherish and understand it's not we did not earn it we cannot earn it mm -hmm. and so we can be uh, that we might become righteous through his death mm -hmm. now that tax collector he was very repentant and humble. Mm -hmm. Now, if he went back home the next week and started sinning again. Maybe. And then he was repentant and humbled the following week. Mm -hmm. Now, would that be something that would be going on and on? Or would God, because he was repentant and humble, would God start working on him to make him stronger not to sin the next week? We I hope don't so. It wouldn't be a complete lack of sin, but an improvement. An improvement. <coughs> by, and by, by saying prayers like that, you give God permission to act within you and to improve you. Well, he knew his, you think? He knew his mm -hmm. basic status. The Pharisee was in love with himself. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. And the Pharisee did not give God any room in him to improve anything? because he, he, he didn't think he needed any help. He didn't need it. It was all a facade, too. The whole thing he was... He was probably well off financially, and his health was good. What else do you need as an indicator? That's proof. That's proof <laughs> that you're loved by yeah. God, that you're... Well, another verse that's often used, a, a small passage. Well, I should say the whole chapter is used to try to explain all this, and that's Isaiah 53. I'm going to pick out four verses from the middle of that, starting with verse 4, Isaiah 53, verse 4, but he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. In other words, the death that we should die, he died, okay? All the while we thought, we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Why would it be worded like that? All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Does that imply that it was punishment sent by God, or just that we thought it was punishment thought sent by God? I thought, thought it was, because the, the thinking is, if you're well off financially and your health is good, God's smiling on you. Mm -hmm. And only the bad folk uh, would, would have these uh, ailments, mm -hmm. and so he must have been a sinner. Yeah. Another way to say that is, all the while we incorrectly thought that his mm -hmm. suffering was punishment sent by God. But because of our sins, reading verse 5, he was wounded, but beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. He was treated harshly, but endured it humbly. He never said a word, like a lamb about to be slaughtered, like a sheep about to be sheared. He never said a word. So. What does that tell us? Well, remember the punishment that should have been ours. That's not saying that all of us really should be crucified on a cross, is it? It's it, saying that all of us should die. But we are going to die. Well, we're going to either die in baptism, or we're going to die the first death, or we're going to die the first and the second death. So he came that we don't die and just stay die dead. and stay dead. Well, remember again that salvation means healing. And it includes much more than forgiveness of sin. It includes a restoration to a right relationship with God. Remember, faith is a word that describes a correct, right relationship with God. That takes place when we come to realize the truth about him his character and what he has done for us and how he runs his government. So what does it take for us to come to trust God? And let's talk specifically about what that means. Every time we commit a sin, what we're really saying is, God, leave me alone for a minute. I think what I want to do now is better for me than what you want me to do. That's really what we're saying. God, I think I know how to handle my myself right now. Just, just leave me alone for a moment. I know how to do things right now better than what you know. Now, or, or, it, or it could be that we just have an inner compulsion to do something and we know it's not right. Yeah. We pick up that cigarette, we drink that pint of gin, mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah. we know it's not right. So how do we overcome that? 
Any? Staying in the word. <laughs> okay. Hoping we strengthen our faith. The Bible tells us that faith can move mountain. It can heal our diseases and ailments. But it also says without love, you can have uh, faith that move mountain, but without, without love, it's all for naught. Yeah. So the basic thing of everything in the Bible is love. Love for our Creator. You have to recognize our need like the tax collector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. the man who drinks, or lady who drinks a bottle of gin every night, needs to have a class in science on what's happening to their inners. Mm -hmm. and, and so like a knowledge of how God made you and how God's ways will heal you rather than what you're doing to yourself. So I think it comes from education and knowledge. Well, and the guy that eats the donut needs to have the same experience. Yes. <laughs> needs to go through the same training. And then you have trust and say, hey, God has, he designed me, he knows what I should and shouldn't do. Exactly. If we come to know God better and better, and if we gradually begin to realize that he never asks us to do anything which is not for our best good, then we can start saying, God, it may be difficult for, give, for me to give up my selfish ways, but I really realize that if I do it your way, I'm better off. I know you know better than mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't feel like I want to do that. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so we look at the Christ experience, we look at his life and his death, and we know that his punishment didn't come from God, it came from the devil and human beings that were, and was certainly not from God. Now, now let's, we need to start breaking these things down and see if we can get to the punchline here. The Greek word dikaiao, which is translated justification, is, is and, and this is from a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament. These are the experts speaking. It means to cause someone to be in a proper or a right relation with someone else. To put right with, to cause to be in a right relationship with. So, to be justified, if we can use that long Latin word, means that we have been put right or set right with God. If we exercise our faith in God, He will set us right, that's justification, and He will keep us right, and that's sanctification. And we talked about, there's a wonderful explanation of all that in um, lesson, uh, in, I'm sorry, in, in number 21, in lesson number two in our handout for, for a couple weeks ago from Ellen White. Notice that neither of those things is anything that we do. It is something that the Holy Spirit does in us if we give Him opportunity. As we exercise faith in God, we learn that God can and will save and heal all who trust Him. The, those are the kind of people, the ones who trust God, that can safely accept that he can safely accept into his future kingdom. So why don't we use those simple words, set yeah. us right instead of sanctification, and keep us right instead of that big long word, justification. Because that would, that would take away a whole lot of discussion among theologians. I mean, if you give them simple words, there's not that much to argue about. It would Mystify. allow us to understand it. Yeah. Mystify the masses, and that way you can, when you've got your collar on, and you've got you know, calluses on your hands, and you say smooth things, and the people are in awe of you. So instead of saying, God, justify me and sanctify me, we say, God, set me right and keep me right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and think God that's that. much clearer. Yeah. God can do that. All we have to do is give him the opportunity to do that in us. <clears throat> there are many steps that have been suggested as part of the salvation process. Repentance, confession, forgiveness, justification, sanctification are just a few of the steps mentioned in Scripture. But we as human beings, and I want to emphasize this again, do not need to understand all the details of each of those steps. If we come to God and are willing to spend time with Him in Bible study and prayer, God is forgiveness personified. He is just waiting to do whatever is necessary to help us if we give Him the opportunity. He can set us right and keep us right only by faith. That is, we have to trust Him, we have to respect Him, we have to give Him the chance. That means that we have to be willing to spend time with Him in Bible study, 
prayer and witnessing. And Ellen White said this very well in Desire of Ages, page 83, paragraph 4. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him, what's another word for confidence? Faith, faith trust, 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 belief. Our faith in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. The Holy Spirit will come more completely and fully into us and help us to change our lives from these sinful lives which we now have to something much better. If we would be saved at last, she goes on to say, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Once again, that's Desire of Ages, 83, paragraph 4. The yeah. book of Romans. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, even if we use the most basic words, really simple words, there are people who will not understand because they don't have hear to hear. They don't want to hear yeah. because they want to continue doing whatever it is that they do. Yeah. Unfortunately. That's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at the devil. I mean, he has absolutely heard everything that God could possibly have said to him. He has watched the whole plan of salvation from beginning to end. Is he convinced? Mm -hmm. Why not? He doesn't want to be convinced. Well, the book of Romans, especially the first eight chapters, are the clearest presentation of the plan of salvation in all of Scripture. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith we cannot please God. Romans 2.4 suggests that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. How do you think, excuse me, how do you think that actually works? How does the goodness of God lead us to repentance? Well, it's the same when you surround yourself with good people rather than with uh, not good people. They more pull you into mm -hmm. being good. And you look at God and uh, you see all the goodness in Him and mm -hmm. it just, the you don't think about doing anything bad. You're it attracted, if you allow yourself to be, you're attracted to the goodness of God. And that makes a difference. Repentance, true repentance, would lead to justification. But once again, remember that all of this is based on faith, that trust in God which we need. And where does faith come from? Well, Romans 10, 17 gives us a clue. Just look at that. So then, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ. And in the earliest manuscripts, there are some that say through preaching Christ, and that some others say through... Um, message about God. So you can take your pick. Basically it's the same. There's no real difference. So this verse tells us that where faith comes from, it comes from Bible study. If we continue to trust in God, we will receive salvation. Luke 7, 47, Ephesians 1, 7, Romans 4, 7. God will accept us back as his children. Romans 5, 16 and 18 and Romans 8, 1. If we continue to grow in this relationship with called faith, we will eventually receive <laughs> eternal life. Ephesians 2, 1 to 5 and 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I mean, all these things are well documented in Scripture. But it, it yeah. Uh, some people think the being a child of God, having a Christian life is boring. They don't want any part of it. <clears throat> when really God is the creator of the universe, he has such diversity, intelligence, creativity, it's actually a more fun life. Yes. And like I had someone that just became a vegetarian, a man he never thought he would ever. And he said, I used to think, what do vegetarians eat? They can't eat anything. And then he says, I am eating so much and I'm enjoying it so much. And so people have a bad view of that Christianity, it's not fun, it's not intelligent, it's not creative, and that's completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And just like uh, once they try becoming a vegetarian, they see that vegetarian is not boring. Yeah. Oh. Well, if we doubt God's ability to heal and save because we feel that our past has been too sinful, 
then we are literally challenging God's ability as a healing physician. Do we really think there's any limitations to God's healing of capacities? I certainly hope not. What would be better is to say to God, here I am, the worst of the worst. Give it your best shot. Let's see what you can do with me. That's exactly what Paul said, wasn't it? That's exactly <laughs> what he said. Um, God can heal any problem that we might have if we're willing to give him the opportunity. Now, how do we do that? Our past life might seem like nothing more than filthy rags. You remember Isaiah 64, 6. But when Christ comes and we accept his plan for our lives, he will remove those filthy rags and place on us the robe of righteousness. Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. Is there a Bible verse that says God will restore the years that the locusts ate? No, I don't think there is. Oh, I, where did I hear that? Maybe I was reading that the book. He will He restore. will restore the years that the... Locusts ate? Well, there's one book in the Bible, um, and that is... Trying to think just now, one of the minor prophets, Joel, talks all about the locusts. So it must be in there if it's there. I'll have to research. There's Christ. A, oh, sorry. Right. There's a reference of that too in the Maccabees. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's right. Christ's life and death answered all the questions about God. So the angels have no questions about whether he can be trusted anymore. God cleared up everything in the eyes of the onlooking universe. Because of the cross and what it represents, they have come to fully trust him again. All of Satan's accusations have been refuted. There are no more questions or doubts left in the minds of the beings in the rest of the universe. So would we be smart to accept the same evidence that they have accepted? What do you think? They saw Jesus slaughtered by sin and evil and Satan just like a lamb. Mm -hmm. They saw him sliced and diced and killed. And who, who was it that watched the whole crucifixion from beginning to end, right through the darkest night of, we humans couldn't see a thing. Who watched that whole process? All the beings from above. Yep. God, God and his angels, Satan and his angels, and all yep. the beings. From Desire of Ages 764. Now they, are in full agreement with God's plans and they're all watching to see what will happen here on planet Earth. Remember, once again, we're the theater, the stage for the universe right now. And the teaching tools. Yes. How can we be changed from being unrepentant sinners to being children of God? Well, such a radical change is described as a new birth. You remember John 3. But if we are willing to spend time with God and His Word and having con conversations with Him through prayer and Bible study, that very behavior will be changed. Great Controversy, page 555, paragraph 1. When we return to faith in God, we no longer need to be concerned about God's wrath. As we have stated many times before, God's wrath is what? Is simply turning away in loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. So these are, these are incurable rebels that are going to be lost in the end. These are not, you know, almost saints. Was that God's wrath on the cross when Jesus says, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Yeah. We'll talk about that. Unfortunately, while many claim to be Christians want to experience eternal life, far too many of us are too busy, too concerned with our own progress at work or school and making a big paycheck, etc., to find time to spend with God. Remember that we cannot actually change ourselves. God is the one who does the changing. We just need to give Him the opportunity. And anything that separates us from God, as we've already noted, Isaiah 52, 59, verse 2, is deadly, and not just in this sleep death that we know about. Sin can separate us eternally from God. The cross was God's way of demonstrating His own righteousness. That's Romans 3, 25 and 26. If we understand all that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane and later on the cross, we will recognize 
that God is the one who has told the truth in the great controversy. The devil has not told the truth. This should lead us to place our complete trust in our Father God. What is the Bible verse where God says to demonstrate my righteousness like three times? Romans, Romans 3, 25 and 26. Romans 3, 25 and 26, okay. So what actually happens when we repent and confess our sins? Does God's attitude toward us change? No. Does he need to change his attitude? Toward? He's always loved us. John 3.16 promises us that God has always loved us. We've always been his children. He's waiting for us to come back. It is our attitude toward him that needs to change. Does our legal standing before God need to change? Well, who determines what our legal standing actually is? Is there a law even above God somewhere that requires that he must comply with certain things when saving sinners? Well, superficially, it may seem like a simple thing to choose God and reject the devil. I mean, if I asked any of you, you wouldn't even have to think for a second. Yeah, I choose God, I reject the devil. But do we really do that in our day-by-day -day living? Remember that one-third of the angels living in the very presence of God were deceived and followed Satan. They were not sure who could be trusted or who was telling them the truth. Someday, Satan will again appear in human form, pretending to be Christ and claiming that he can save us. Will we be prepared to clearly distinguish between the two Christ and the false Christ? Well, the only way to distinguish between a counterfeit and the true is to know the truth so well that we cannot be deceived. God has only asked us to do three things. What have I said? We've talked about it several times now. To study our Bibles, contemplating especially the life of Christ. To pray, that's the other side of the conversation. And to witness. Now, it might not be obvious right up front why we need to witness. Now, of course, we need to share the news, the good news with other people, and that's, a, that's essential. But there's a very important why we need to share the good news, why we need to witness for our benefit. What is that? It clarifies and strengthens our view. Well, every teacher says the first few years that they teach, they learn more than the students. Yes. Mm -hmm. We need to practice saying it to someone else to clarify it in our own minds. We really, really need that experience. Our Bible study guide says that we must be very clear in distinguish, be, distinguishing between subjective and objective atonement. What do you think that means? No idea. More of those complicated words? Well, subjective atonement means it changes us. We change our attitude. Objective atonement presumably means God somehow brings us closer to, to him, literally, somehow, without our changing our attitude. Is that possible? I remind you once again, you're going you're to think I'm a broken record here, salvation means healing. Why do we need to focus so much on the first steps in the plan of salvation? That seems what we're always focusing on, without going on to see what, ha what happens next. When will we move on? Look at, uh, at Hebrews 5, starting with verse 11. Paul was trying to teach a group of young theology students. There is much, and he goes, to, he says, he'd been talking about, remember Melchizedek. There is much we have to say about this matter, but it is hard to explain to you because you are so slow to understand. There has been enough time for you to be teachers. And I wonder what he would say to Adventists, who've been Adventists all their lives. huh? There's enough time for you to be teachers, yet you still need someone to teach you the first lessons of God's message. Instead of eating solid food, you still have to drink milk. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a child without any experience in the matter of right and wrong. Without any experience in the matter of right and wrong, does that sound like we're ready to stand up and, and, and face the devil? Solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who through practice, who through practice are able to distinguish between good and evil. And he goes on to explain that that's what we need to do. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16 says something very similar. We need to mature, 
to no longer to be children tossed about by every uh, wave of doctrine. And the people who, at the, live, who are alive at the end of time are going to go through Job-like experiences. Are we prepared? Satan has been incredibly successful at misrepresenting the character of God and deceiving angels and human beings here on this earth. We have believed all sorts of awful things about God. How are, we, how are these issues to be straightened out? The only way was for God himself to come and live and die the way he did. Jesus was fully God. For 33 years, we had an opportunity to see what it would be like to have God here among us. No angel could correctly and fully represent God. Only God could do that. The beginning Christian should stand at the foot of the cross and be moved by, God, by Christ's great sacrifice for each one of us. But those who are, of us who have been on the way much longer need to say, okay, it's time to move on. The great controversy is not over some legal technicality. It is a war over real differences. Who God is versus who Satan claim, what Satan claims about him. God's government operates on love. Satan's government operates on selfishness. Satan believes that given the opportunity, each one of us would choose to be selfish. Sin is rebellion against God. 1 John 3, 4. In heaven as well as here on this earth. Um, thus, sin is not simply a wrongful act, as in driving through a red light, red light, but an actual revolt against God. Jesus came to deal with sin. Romans 8, we mentioned it before, verse 3. Through Jesus Christ, God was reconciling us to himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God's love for us has never changed. We are the ones who need to learn the truth about him, return to our trust in him, and be reconciled to him. That requires cooperation on our part. By beholding, we become changed. We allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and in our minds. We cannot make these changes on our own. Only God can. But even He cannot do anything without our cooperation. Are we, as a church, as individuals, willing to give God that opportunity? Are we willing to open up and say, Holy Spirit, come and change us? That's our prayer for you this week. Thank you.